Let's talk now about virginity. We're going to talk about six, seven slides all about virginity. And I think a lot of this is going to be brand new for a lot of you. So pay close attention. Very interesting. And fully and 100% patristic teaching. Virginity is the pre-fallen state. The first created humans did not have knowledge of marriage in paradise. This is unfortunately not a teaching common to some Western confessions. They've fallen into this delusion to think that before the fall, Adam and Eve had relations. No, they did not. The first created did not. They had no knowledge of marriage in paradise. They knew each other only after the fall. They knew each other in, the, in terms of relations. They were virgins in paradise. This state of virginity will prevail in God's kingdom as it was originally intended for Adam and Eve. And everyone will be living like the angels in heaven, whether they entered marriage in this present life or not. I'm going to repeat that. That's phenomenal. It's both awesome, I think, in terms of a teaching, but also just extremely hopeful for all of us. No matter what our life is, married or monastic, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, listen. It's what we do in, the, in these, these blessed states. This state of virginity will prevail in God's kingdom as it was originally intended for Adam and Eve, and everyone will be living like the angels in heaven, whether they entered marriage in this present life or not. Far, far from disparaging marriage, it says at the end of the day, all those who enter the kingdom of God, all those who live in God's kingdom will live like the angels whether they were married or not, okay? So the Lord said clearly that in the kingdom of God, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. This is for this world. It's a temporary state, right? Virginity is the foretaste of the kingdom of God. Marriage has become a necessity for fallen man. And as such, it is a form of this age. It is a form of this age, marriage. This is very helpful to all of us if we pay close attention and meditate on this when we start talking about how relations within marriage should be carried out, what are the boundaries? And so many people are scandalized today. So many people, clergy, bishops, so who supposedly are teaching us the Orthodox way, are telling us that it doesn't matter. Free for all. There's no boundaries within marriage. Sexual relations, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Just go. That's, this is absurd and demonic. Of course it matters. Everything matters. Modesty in all things. It is here, again, marriage has become a necessity of the fallen man, and as such, it is a form of this age. It has the blessing of God. He praises it. All the married will be like angels as well that enter the kingdom of God. But it is for this age. And he says this, if man had not sinned, marriage would not exist. If man had not sinned, marriage would not exist. So clearly it's for this temporary life and not for eternity. If you ask then, why was Eve created? The answer, according to St. Irenaeus, is that this took place because God foresaw the fall. So again, out of love for man, out of love for the continuation of the human race, out of love for Adam, Man, God, in his foresight, created and brought about Eve. He instituted marriage after the fall to keep this living being called man from being lost through extinction. So it is a wonderful and glorious thing that God has done for, for mankind. So marriage is a form of this age, while virginity is a foretaste of the kingdom. Yes, it is, but it's still blessed. It is still blessed and glorious. and. More importantly, everything that God gives us is for our salvation. So marriage is given for salvation. This is what we have to remember. There's people who write me. I just had somebody write me the last two days. They said, Father, my spouse wants to divorce me. I'm struggling to keep the marriage going. And I asked, well, does this do, does your spouse, do you understand what marriage is about? Do you understand that it's about their salvation, that they're walking away from salvation? Did you have guidance? No. Did you have a spiritual father? No, we didn't have one together. Did you understand? No. So many people 
began marriage, lived throughout marriage, didn't have a common spiritual father, didn't understand why, why are they married? Because they like somebody, they love somebody, they sexually want to be with somebody. What is the point? It's for salvation. It's for union with God. It's for acquiring uh, this communion, which will then bring all the virtues. And then we will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. So when you walk away from that, you're walking away from the cross, which is your salvation. You're walking away from the struggle. And you walk away from the third person who's in the unity, the union of marriage. There's three people, not two. There's three. And you're walking away from him as well. So very problematic. Very problematic. Of course, there are extreme cases where maybe there is no other option, but it certainly isn't blessed. It's the katapara horosi. It's the allowance of God and not his will. So the elder says, some people are in great hurry to taste marriage before marriage with premarital relations, which is certainly immorality. He just wants to drive that home because, as we all know, so many are confused today. According to St. Ignatius, who you see here on the left, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who writes to Polycarp, if anyone is able to remain in purity in honor of the Lord's flesh, he must do so without boasting. All right, so he's saying, look, if you will, you can, you want to be a virgin, remain a virgin, do not boast. So he's it, here the key is the disposition, the desire, right? So that's part of what, is that is is the half of, of of this image of virginity virginity is not an unnatural state but rather a supranatural state it's that which will be in eternity what adam and eve had before the fall it is above nature in terms of this age but indeed natural under the prism of the pre-fallen state so pre-fallen natural in this fallen reality that's around us outside and among those who are in this world. It is supra, above nature. This is the spiritual virginity the, and physical virginity together. The physical state, which is not so difficult, is simply avoid bodily union, okay? Simply never have sexual relations. That is the negative side. The negative side of virginity. Not that difficult, he says. Interesting. Huh? A lot of people will find it very difficult because they're enslaved to the lust and desire of the flesh. Very difficult. Seems like impossible. Seems like a mountain. But without the grace of God, it is. Without, without Christ, we can do nothing. So that's probably what's missing. In any case, he says it's this is the one side. But spiritual virginity is extremely difficult. Spiritual virginity. This is accomplished when one develops virginity in the soul and in the thoughts. In the first volume of the Philokalia, St. Cassian, St. John Cassian, the Roman, quotes St. Basil on fornication, who said, talking now, we're getting into the deeper mystery of the spiritual virginity, and listen to what the great, great Basil, the great Basil says. I have no knowledge of a woman, and yet I am not a virgin. And so what does he mean there? He means the physical side, he has no knowledge. He is a physical virgin, and had no knowledge, no no relations, and yet he's not a virgin. In other words, spiritually, he understands spiritual virginity has not achieved. And this is truly, truly an amazing confession that all of us, including those especially who are trotting the path of virginity, monastic life, etc., they need to keep this in mind. The spiritual virginity is greatly, a uh, great, great difficulty to achieve in this life. So, it is a privilege that is only ascribed to three persons in our church. The Most Holy Theotokos, St. John the Baptist, and St. John the Theologian. You know, officially as titles, that's who we gave that title to. The Virgin Mary, St. John the Baptist, of course, a virgin. St. John the Theologian, virgin. The state of virginity for all others is relative because of the spiritual virginity is so hard to achieve, right? We're not talking about physical, but spiritual. A harsh struggle takes place for the virginity of the inner man, of the soul, and of the heart. A bloody struggle, indeed. St. John of the, Clim of the latter, Climacus, he says, uh, well, before he says that, let me read what the elders leads up. Virginity is a virtue 
And three ingredients are necessary to classify something as a virtue. Three ingredients to classify something as a virtue. A man's free will, his effort, and the grace of God. A man's free will, his effort, and the grace of God. Why do the Orthodox reject the Immaculate Conception doctrine promulgated in the mid-19th century by the Pope? Why does the Orthodox reject that? One reason they reject that is that it cannot be classified as a virtue if the Mother of God had no choice but to remain totally free of sin. In other words, her free will was not at work. The effort was not there. The human side, the synergy, was from the moment of conception, there was no, no possibility. There was not, it's not going to happen. There's no free choice anymore. There's no free will. That's how... One, my understanding and how the Orthodox have looked at this problematic approach. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of debate and, and, and the rest, but that is one thing that comes to mind when you see this, and that is the traditional objection to that doctrine. Uh, so St. John of the Latter writes on this, virtue is a work toward God, towards God by one's disposition. So, so much emphasis on the free will and disposition. If you have that taken away at the conception, obviously. Where's the virtue then in that? This towards God, quote unquote, towards God, expresses virtue as grace from God, by God's help, with the purpose of virtue being for God. The Lord expresses it as follows. Not all men can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. In other words, personal effort and struggle. That man, that woman, that virgin is going to have great personal effort and great struggle. And it's not for all but those who it is given. And we'll unpack that. So disposition is key. <clears throat> and one, as one must desire to practice this virtue freely, not under compulsion. Again, not under compulsion, not possible. <clears throat> How many of us have children? We try to push them to be virtuous. You've got to be virtuous. You've got to go to church. You've got to pray. Why didn't you pray? Eh. We all make that mistake. We all fall into that trap. It's not going to happen. It's not virtue for doing that, right? Now, are we going to train them and teach them? Yes, but as insofar as they grow older and older, that cannot that virtue's got to be of their choosing and doing and disposition, right? That's what's got to they've got to take over more and more. We've got to recede. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time. The servant of God does not resort to fasting because there is nothing to eat. That's not why he fasts. Oh, there's nothing to eat. I'll fast. That's not a virtue. The servant of God fasts even though he has plenty to eat. He might be filled with food in the refrigerator. He doesn't care. He still fasts. So fasting is a virtue because it requires effort, free will, and the grace of God. That is why the Lord, that is why the Lord says about virginity, not all men can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. In other words, You've got to have that force, that violence against the old man to achieve, to keep physical virginity and achieve spiritual virginity. So don't force yourself if it is not a calling given to you by God. He's saying to people who are constantly, you hear this all the time from spiritual, spiritual fathers get these kind of questions and when I was a young man, I was asking this kind of question. Should I be a monk? I want to be a monk. I don't know. if Should I be married? Should I be a monk? Should I be married? Should I be a monk? And the elder is saying here, look, it's given to those who of themselves are, are it's coming within them. They're longing for it. They're desiring this struggle. Their disposition is there. If you got to force, force yourself to have the disposition you're going to force yourself, even if you have the disposition, but if you're going to force yourself to have the disposition and you're going to pressure yourself and push yourself, but you don't really want to do it, you're not really interested, and you're not there, probably needs all three, the grace of God and your free will and your effort, all three. This is suggestive of the divine institution of virginity and the divine inclination according to St. John Chrysostom. In other words, the element of grace. He says, the one who can withstand this, let him do it. So this shows the free will and the effort of man. That's the big part, right? The grace of God comes, but that's the big part on our, on our end. So this virtue needs both factors. It means both, both and, always both and. I must be willing and I must receive this calling, this grace. 
from God. Both and. I must be willing and I must have this grace. One of the ways you, you see, oh, I have, the, I want and I have the grace is essentially things recede and all that's left is the life in the, the monastic life, the, the life of virginity, right? Nothing else is of interest. Nothing else burns. Nothing else is of interest. You just, you lose interest in other things and that remains. That's one way that I've seen many times people come and say, yes. I, and that's a, a way of saying God opening the doors to you. You have the desire and you have the grace and the grace shuts out everything else and opens the door only to the church and the monastic life. When both of these factors meet, then we have the element of virtue. If virginity were not a virtue, then Christ would not have given to give, would not have to give his kingdom to the virgins, right? So virginity is a great virtue. And uh, it's proof that it's a great virtue that Christ gives this in this passage to those virgins, he gives the kingdom. The kingdom of God is given only the virtue and holiness. He's not, he's not given to anything else. There's no other way to get into the kingdom. There's no way I have somebody who's going to get me into the kingdom. I don't really want, but it's, you know, I'm, I I got to pay it. I can pay enough money. I'll get into the kingdom. No, it's not, nothing else except virtue, holiness, purification, illumination, deification, communion. That's what opens up the kingdom. So for this reason, virginity, much like all the other virtues, does not complete its purpose if it is autonomous, excluding a life in Christ. It's very difficult to impossible for any spiritual progress to be made in spiritual virginity and even to keep physical virginity, virginity if it's not in Christ, in the life in Christ. It's, it's not really even something we can talk about. So who then are the 144,000 virgins in Revelation 4 and 5? Who are these? They will be all those who shined through the centuries as shining examples of asceticism, obedience, and virginity. They are the ascetics of all centuries, of all seasons, until the end of the age, until the end of history. These are the 144,000 virgins, the 144,000, the particular 144,000, the big group, the number used for this group that is described in this passage, not to be confused with the previous 144,000 in chapter 7. I see on this day.